All right, guys, let's uh, get it started. All right, so how are you guys feeling so far today? Good? Awesome, awesome. yeah, that's what I want to hear, awesome. Uh, so uh, thank you for coming today, everyone. My name is Sammy, and I will be the MC for you guys today. Before we announce our first speaker, let's uh, appreciate the people that make this event possible. First, let's start with our sponsor, VM Tenzo Labs, for allowing us to host this event and providing the beverage for us. So if you guys have any beverages, please use the fridge over there only. And then Contentful for providing us with this uh, pizza over there. And now, let's uh, express our gratitude for our volunteers today. The volunteers today are Marco, Tenson, Divish, Zinab, Jack, Karen, and AJ. Yeah, they have the reason everything's possible. And now let's acknowledge our speaker for today, Taz Singh, and then Rohan Nair, and Dan Toliver. And, and of course, our special guest for today is Ben Winiger. Awesome. Uh, now let's give us a quick introduction. Uh, Toronto JS is a volunteer-run nonprofit corporation that aims to support everyone in the journey of learn and share their passion for JavaScript and also, of course, software, software development. And then we have over 1,200 members on Meetup and in-person events, around 5,800 members on Slack, uh, 700 plus on Guild, and a dedicated team of over 14 uh, volunteers. So if you ever want to partner up with us, you can like send an email to sponsor at torontojs.com. And this is the event that's uh, gonna come out soon. In next week, November 15, we have uh, Toronto JS social in person. And then on the Sunday, November 19th, we have a uh, code club, basically mob uh, programming, hosted by uh, Marco and Dale. And then uh, on Sunday, November 26, we have a video game online social event. So make sure to check that out as well. And then there will be the last uh, Tech Talk event that will be happening on uh, next month, uh, December 6. And also, uh, we dedicated to provide abuse-free, harassment-free event experience for everyone. So if you find out like someone has been uh, harassed you or anything, please make sure uh, to contact us. And then you can contact this person on the screen over there. Or alternatively, you can uh, send a report on the link over there. And also uh, to join the Slack if you guys want to. So now let's allow VMware to make a quick introduction. And uh, let's welcome Robert to do a quick introduction there. I will be very, very quick. Um, welcome to our space. Um, we are VMware, specifically VMware Tanzu Labs welcomes you. So we are a consultancy that does extreme programming to help clients modernize and build new applications. So if you ever find yourself trying to learn something new or modernize a big stack, we work with a lot of Fortune 500 companies, you can give us a call and welcome and I hope you enjoy your stay. Thank you so much. And then let's uh, give a one quite quick one minute of thank you for content for, for providing the pizza for today. And they are one of the generous uh, sponsor of today's uh, Tech Talk event. Their support has fueled our tech uh, community learnings and network. Thank you, Contentful. Okay, so let's uh, introduce our first speaker, Rohan Nair. While he's getting ready, let's uh, give a quick introduction about him. Uh, he is the tech giant of Toronto, over 13 years of uh, coding ex magic in the tech industry. He is now the head of the engineer at Nautical Conference. 
and navigating the ship in the unexplored areas of uh, innovation. And that just the first chapter. His journey ranging from startups to uh, tech throne in the Toronto-based BC will unveil the mystery behind his tech tail. So enter the amazing world of Graphic QL Federation. But before that, he will show us some secrets about creating job resume that can guarantee more job interviews and callbacks. So give a round of applause for one and only Rohan Nair. Yeah, so. Oh no, you're gonna need this one. You recording the screen, right? Taz is currently harassing me to record my screen, so. <laughs> we shall do that. Thank you, Rohan. Rohan, do you want to use the clip mic? Uh, it's clipped on me in theory. Would you like to help with this? As if you can use your other hand. <laughs> Okay, Taz, how do I do this? Uh, you got quick time there, yeah? Quick time. Quick time, well, bam. Awesome. I'm happy that everybody gets to see how technically inept I am today. New screen recording options. Oh, whoa. What's going on here? Select quick time player. Uh, we'll turn on your microphone, because why not? Record the entire screen, record, you're done. And then whenever you're finished, you hit that little button up there. Oh, lovely, look at that. Taz um, so everybody. This is, um, this is, oh, okay, cool, okay, cool, there you go, you're good. Awesome, <clears throat> um, okay, so I, I apparently, <laughs> this morning I woke up and I, uh, I looked at Lever uh, system and I got really, really annoyed because it seems like one person out of the 300 people who had applied to the job that I posted yesterday actually read the job description and so I was making a, a facetious comment in Toronto.js about how people should read job descriptions and apply to jobs that are tailored to what they want to do in life. So that's my quick preamble. There you go, Simon. Um, <clears throat> so the, the real talk I'm going to do. Uh, Federated GraphQL. Uh, this is going to be probably 10-ish minutes of me. I'm going to show you a little bit of code that I actually ran. For those who've been to a talk of mine before, this might be a surprising thing that I've actually ran the code before, but here we are. So, Federated GraphQL. Let's talk about Google's mistakes. So, first off, hi, I'm Rohan. I am, uh, I've been in the tech for about the last 14 years in various startups, spent a lot of time in VC, and I've built a couple of different companies. Uh, I don't take off the how to build and exit companies, but uh, everything else, I suppose, uh, that's what you're here to do. Uh, at this point in time, I'm running uh, engineering at this company called Nautical Commerce. We build marketplace software. What that really means is like, if we think of Shopify, they have a bunch of single vendor commerce companies on their system, goods in the back, you can ship those. We're trying to build an abstraction layer over that, which allows companies to build marketplaces like an Amazon or a Walmart, or really the more interesting part for me is when companies are gonna build the next Uber or Lyft on, or Airbnb on top of our systems. So anybody sitting here thinking like, hey, I want to do my next company on marketplaces, feel free to talk to me after this. We can uh, scheme on some stuff. So um, <clears throat> I loathe microservices as an architectural pattern. I see the value in them in certain places, but uh, the, the last few years of my life has been going into different companies as a fractional CTO or as an engineering leader. And basically, I'm helping them pivot out of microservices because they ended up having 7,000 services and like four employees. So, um, a lot of this really came from our good friends, Google, who have come up with a lot of different crazy ideas in software, but uh, this one I didn't particularly enjoy because it's one of those things that. Not only did Google come up with a somewhat janky architecture, they also decided to go crazy marketing it with Kubernetes. Um, does anybody here uh, suffer through Kubernetes on a daily basis? All right, there we go. So yeah, uh, uh, this, this Kubernetes suffering for us at Nautical, uh, we, we had an uninspiring person who initially architected this stuff and we're now sitting with like, Four uh, Kubernetes clusters per uh, uh, per customer, etc. It's it, it complicated, but the good news is we didn't do microservices. So the Kubernetes side somehow Google marketing won there, but microservices itself is like another beast, uh, and a, a lot of that beastliness comes from the fact that nobody really knows how to separate services well. 
And with that lack of knowledge of how to separate services, you also get a lot of different things where like organizational structures are shipped. I forget what the name of that law is. But you get organizational structure shipped and then at the end of the day, people are gonna move jobs and then nobody knows what's actually going on in any of these microservices and you get into microservice hell. And then a lot of people will go online and be like, hey, what's Google doing? What's Netflix doing? And then realize that Netflix and Google have tons of microservices and they say, okay, cool, let's do that as well. And then when they run out of money, they call me and to come in and try to fix stuff and I go, oh God, I gotta get out of here. So uh, let, let's talk a little bit more about why microservice is the dumbest thing. Um, this is what I expect happen at Google one day. Uh, they're just gonna completely I ignore a lot of interesting things. <laughs> but it's more the implementation of a, a decent idea, a decent computer science course. It's completely, completely uh, hijacked by a lot of different things. Uh, so the interesting part about all this is like a couple weeks ago I was just scouring the internet as I, as I tend to do and uh, uh, found out that uh, Google actually has a, a new updated view on this. And uh, Google actually released a paper, uh, I think it was maybe three weeks ago, where basically they admitted from in a scientific perspective that uh, microservices kind of suck. And I mean the, the big point here is really the challenges that microservices introduces into your tech stack actually is very, very much more challenging than anybody expected. And so you just have like the law of unintended consequences going and compounding and you get into craziness. And Google's literally now got a paper on this. I'm gonna toss it to Toronto.js uh, later uh, so people can take a look at it. I'm not gonna put the, a, a long uh, ArcSiv link on here, but this is literally something that came out of that paper. And the, 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 thing, the thing is like, Google actually went deep enough into this to actually recommend a whole crazy new architecture. And that architecture is called modular monoliths. Um, who here has ever heard of a monolith before? Yeah, exactly. Google has remade up the things that we've already all known for 20 years. Uh, and the modular part is really, hey, organize your code in a nice manner, where you can split it up if you need to, but the fact of the matter is, you wanna have nice separation of concerns, you wanna encapsulate things properly, and again, core application development principles are brought back in. Apparently it's taken them 15 years of making us all suffer through microservice to figure out what we all kind of already knew. Unfortunately, I'm gonna give some credit to DHH here. Uh, Rails already knew this for a long time ago, and, and the Node world has, most, uh, has mercifully started moving back towards proper uh, uh, modular monoliths, and I think like for me especially, Fastify was the one that really uh, enabled that again. And that Matteo Colina, who's the creator of Fastify, who's also a Node uh, core member, has been really, really pushing this. I know it's a Fastify fan right there. Um, so, uh, where do we go from here? Well, like, everything is new again. Frankly, like, nothing needs to change a whole lot in terms of how people are doing applications, except don't bother trying to decompose them. Don't bother trying to build teams around them. Um, there's new ways of doing stuff, and, and the, the new ways of doing stuff is not really patterns, but rather it's the technology that allows us to build interesting stuff. And so I'm gonna go into this a little bit, but uh, first let's look at some awesome graphics that I did. Uh, this took me 30 seconds in Excalibur, but like this is what microservices ends up being. This is a bit of a facetious view, and I, don't, I didn't uh, map out all the different dependencies between the services, but with all this stuff comes a lot of complexity around how you're actually handling service discovery, how you're handling orchestration, how you're handling error handling, how you're handling logging when you have a request that's going through a bunch of different microservices, and for some inexplicable in reason, somebody decided once upon a time that every single microservice should hit their own database, which I fundamentally have never understood that one. Mercifully, I'm also an Elixir developer, and there's much smarter people in the Elixir land who said, let's not do that nonsense. So, what does a modular monolith look like? Well, guess what, it's, it's pretty obvious. We're just gonna organize a bunch of these different, different functionality pieces, and we'll have these lovely things that we call monoliths. Again, we're not decomposing anything. Everybody probably has applications like this, except the nuance here is that I've got two of those monoliths. And the two of those monoliths are sitting behind a gateway layer, and, and I've also cut out two databases just to make my point, but um, this pattern is something that actually hasn't been done too much in terms of a single applic uh, sorry, multiple applications behind a single gateway layer. For years and years and years. But I think there's new ways and new techniques of being able to do this and being able to orchestrate uh, across teams, across organizations, to the point where you can control a lot of the complexity of having 3,000 developers on a project in a similar uh, pattern and similar architecture. 
And so <clears throat> I'm going to show you one example of this. And this is an example that is very much tied to GraphQL, because in theory, I thought we were doing a GraphQL-themed uh, event, and Taz decided to go do something else. Uh, but the, the thing that I got really, really excited about well, was this concept of what's better than GraphQL. Okay. You can have a GraphQL gateway layer, and that can basically abstract over all the different APIs underneath it. Again, not that crazy of a concept. Frankly, AWS kind of gave us this with API Gateway and then all those crazy lambdas that they have. Also, really quickly, some AWS teams have, sorry, some Amazon teams have gone backwards from lambdas into monoliths. So like there's more and more evidence that even the big companies are realizing the error of their ways. So this pattern, let's go through it really quickly. In code. So um, let me pull up code really quick. This is going to be fun when I try to code while holding this. So I have three applications uh, that are going to be running here. I have uh, a random... I will hold it. I will be wow, a microphone holder. Look at that. He comes all the way from London and uh, holds this for me. London, UK. Um, so I have one application running right here. I'm going to talk about that in a second. I have a second application running here. Uh, these are very, very well named applications, as you can tell. App one is on the bottom right, app two is up here. And then up here, we have a gateway. So uh, I'm, I'm going to go into the code on these two really quick just to show how simple it is. But the gateway, uh, really quickly, um, it looks like this. There's a couple different things. And really, if I go LSA, uh, there's a few different things. And then there's this dot mesh rc.yaml. So we're going to talk about this in a quick second. So first things first, let's do VS Code. So I'm actually going to close all this. So this is not a monorepo or anything like that. This is just me putting all this stuff into folders. But here's the application number one. Uh, because I'm a JavaScript hipster, I'm using Varna. And Alicia is just a, a Varna HTTP uh, framework. But uh, I have here two really, really simple endpoints. Uh, this slash endpoint is just returning hello world. And then I just enter a little bit more here. I've got hello endpoint and then uh, I have a new parameter that I'm pulling out. Blah, blah, blah. Let's go test this out really quickly. So this one's running at 3,000. So let's go. Uh, you want to make your font a bit bigger? I'm going to make my font considerably bigger. There we go. So let's go curl. Ugh. Let's do this way. 3,000. Boom. Hello, world. Uh, and then uh, let's go hello, Rohan. I'm just going to pipe this into JQ so it's nice in theory. OK, apparently not. Um, and great. Like I have this back. Let's, let's go. Let's say hello to Taz. Great. So. There's nothing really special about that. It's just a, a RESTful API. Um, that's the end of my presentation. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and so then uh, we have a second one here, app two. This one is a GraphQL uh, API, again, using the same sort of things. But I'm using uh, Yoga, which is a, a GraphQL guild uh, uh, library. Uh, we're going to talk about GraphQL guild in a second. And I have like the greatest uh, API of all time. Uh, I have a query. I have a me, which is a user. A user type has name. And then it has a bunch of books. And then I have a book. It's a bunch of titles. And of course, uh, I have this incredible data structure here known as an array. And uh, we're just going to go quickly into GraphQL. And here's a quick query. Um, I'm going to make this all pretty. Uh, let's run this query. Great. I get everything back. So again, I've done nothing interesting here in theory, if you find this interesting. Sweet. You're on a learning path. Um, but the, the point here is I have a REST API I have a GraphQL API. Um, the one interesting part about GraphQL APIs is that it comes with documentation at the get-go. So there's this concept of introspection. You can go look at the entire uh, structure of the graph and pull out a lot of other details. Um, the nuance you might have noticed with uh, this index.ts in app one is that I have swagger up here. This is unfortunately one of the actual dependencies I needed. But here's my swagger documents. I have my slash endpoint. I have my slash hello with a parameter, and then do a bunch of stuff. In theory, I can test try this out, but I haven't actually uh, tested that, so I'm not going to do that. So that's all the easy stuff. Now let's go into the, the fun stuff. Um, so in here is my gateway. I'm going to close these things up. In here is my gateway. And if you notice, there's, there's no code in this gateway. There's only this one little YAML file. And this one little YAML file uh, uh, is the URL of my Swagger documents. So if we look here, localhost 3000 Swagger JSON. If I come in here, localhost 3000 Swagger. It took about 20 minutes to figure out that this button existed. But here's the actual JSON version of uh, uh, the, the, the Swagger docs, which is an open API spec. And then as I've already kind of mentioned, GraphQL comes with uh, uh, the uh, documentation built in. And so in this case, I'm just giving it an endpoint 
And then the library that I'm going to use to actually stitch these two things together is going to actually introspect that endpoint and do a, a, a few more things. And so really quickly, let's take a step backwards. So let's go into package.json. Um, I'm using a library called GraphQL Mesh. Uh, there are other competing libraries as well. Apollo has an Apollo Federation, which is a, sim uh, a really similar thing. Um, there's two reasons I used GraphQL Mesh in this. One, in general, I have a little bit of an allergy to what uh, Apollo libraries. I've had not a great experience with them, including some interesting things that the founder has said to me about why uh, GraphQL introspection and building generated types. Uh, uh, well, I mean, he just has some very f weird viewpoints. Um, but the, the second part of this is also when we evaluated GraphQL Mesh and Apollo Federation at work, we realized that Apollo Federation is missing a lot of different features, despite being like uh, a product launched by a venture back company that GraphQL Mesh like has in spades. And GraphQL Mesh is actually from this a uh, group called GraphQL Guild, and frankly, Taz is the one who put me on the GraphQL Guild, but it's like a very high quality set of libraries done by effectively like a collection of freelancers and open source advocates who are working together to build like interesting stuff. Um, and I, like I heard about it from Taz, and I worked at this, uh, uh, this agency where we had like some of the best GraphQL people in the world, like Taz's friend, Phil Pluckton, um, who okay. put me onto GraphQL Guild, and this is really about like, so it's really like a, uh, a lovely collection of things and that everybody should check out at different points in time because there's a lot of really strong libraries. You may have noticed in my GraphQL app, I'm not using Apollo server or anything like that, I'm using Yoga. Yoga is a GraphQL guild thing and there's a few other pieces around uh, enterprise level hardening, etc. So that's my quick uh, shilling of GraphQL guild, please go check it out. But anyway, I have this. This is the entirety of what I've gotten here. If you look at my package JSON, Yes, I have a couple of different libraries in here for my GraphQL connector, for my open API Swagger connector, and then the usual GraphQL, uh, uh, GraphQL JS library. And then I have a CLI in here that I'm gonna use in a second. Um, and apparently this is MIT licensed, but uh, we're not gonna publish this too much. And so what I'm gonna go here, I'm gonna quickly go, uh, so th this particular top one is, is just yarn because I didn't wanna go super, super hipster with bun on this one, but I'm just gonna go yarn dev. And apparently, no, I'm gonna go yarn start. There we go, and yarn start runs uh, dev. And so here we go, here's a, here's a second uh, GraphQL window. So uh, the astute amongst you might notice that this is Yoga GraphQL and this is GraphQL Mesh. Uh, it looks exactly the same, actually it doesn't, <coughs> no wait, never mind. it does look the same, it's just documentation. Uh, <coughs> but. Uh, it's the same thing, but except it's a different application. And this one's running at port 4000, and there's a few other pieces in here. We're gonna ignore this for the time being, but we will run a query in a second. But um, I've done nothing magic, right? Like, has anybody seen anything magic so far, or has everybody just seen me be explicit with code? Okay, I'm gonna go with explicit with code. Um, here's what's happening here uh, within this query. Oh, well, look at this. I have more than just my me and my books, as opposed to here, where I have like name books, uh, this is actually my user object, so me, books, this is my, what's happening here, but there's two other endpoints here. And if we, if we think back to this documentation, well, hey, I have a slash route, and I have a hello, uh, parameterized uh, hello route here as well, and hey, all of a sudden, I have now created GraphQL uh, out, of, uh, uh, out of REST. So the other thing is, I didn't go crazy with this, I could have gone a bit crazier, I could have properly parsed the JSON, et cetera, but like, we don't need to do that at this point in time, but let's run some GraphQL queries. Let's see how this works. So first things first, let's run this query. And boom. Same thing, fantastic. Uh, let's run a different query. Let's run uh, get hello by name. Whoops. And this one is gonna take a name. And uh, let's say hi to Taz again, because he was such an excellent assistant. Uh, and look at that, uh, hello Taz is showing back up. And um, if this is kind of underwhelming, well the thing is I've done absolutely nothing other than like 10 lines of configuration to stitch together two APIs. But the thing is, I'm not limited to just doing REST or GraphQL. I'm a little crazy with these APIs. There was a point in time earlier this week where I was like, oh, I should just like learn some Go, put up a, 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 a gRPC uh, scenario and like show that off as well. But I ran out of time because I'm an exec and all they make me do is go to meetings. Um, 
but like the, the scenario really is that you can go crazy with what you're putting behind your mesh. So let's go into uh, GraphQL mesh. <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on, we got this one. There we are. Okay, so here we go. The guild.dev, let's go into here really quickly. Let's take a look at the docs. There's a bunch of examples, but like uh, the, the reality here is there's a lot of different sources that we can use. Um, GraphQL and Open API swagger stuff is what I've already got, but like we can go crazy with protobufs, we can go crazy with uh, actually hitting Postgres in theory. I have never tried that. I, I don't really have a lot of uh, uh, use cases for that, but like this thing can abstract over a number of different pieces. The other important part is also you can abstract over other GraphQL APIs. So if I wanted to, I could probably put the GitHub API behind this and be able to, to test it out. But the entire thing is I'm gonna stitch this together into one gateway. And so I just have a single uh, place that I actually have to expose to the internet, put my load balancer in front of it, do my TLS uh, uh, termination and whatnot. But behind all of that is the entire power of all of my different services or all of my different modular monoliths. More importantly though, this allows us to actually compose and decompose applications. And so instead of having to ship something that is like every single service you have under the sun, maybe you, and like this is a nautical problem, maybe we have a couple different customers who only get a subset. And I can still expose that subset with the configuration. And the lovely part about configuration is that I don't actually have to go back into a whole deployment cycle to actually edit that. I can go and likely, if I set this up properly, my ops side properly, I can go and edit configurations on the fly and let my applications quickly discover each other and do the proper abstraction, do the proper introspection and like expose a lot more stuff than, or sorry, expose stuff that like I want exposed. Other thing that we're gonna be doing here with Nautical is like, we're gonna be composing a lot of pieces, but we're also gonna start breaking up our, our, our applications into like, storefront facing pieces or backend facing pieces or like when we, ha we have some customers who are very, very API focused and very, very strong teams uh, with venture funding, et cetera, they want ultimate power. They want primitives. They don't need uh, us to build them full out applications. So we can expose just those pieces. And like for me as the person who's got to run the engineering budget, it means that I'm not sitting there ripping my lack of hair out uh, because GCP keeps changing costs every other week. This is a true story. Um, Rather, I'm sitting there saying, great, I can actually have, uh, I can actually minimize the, uh, the, 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 the amount of things that I'm deploying, minimize resource usage, um, and really have a lot more control over my entire application stack. But then the other side of it too is that I'm not really introducing a whole lot of complexity on the SDLC pipe. Like, yes, we have to be organized. We have to use linear better. Uh, we have to make sure that we're communicating better. We have to like be at whiteboards more, but that's core culture. That's a different part of my job. In this particular case is basically saying, great, we have a configuration layer, a gateway layer, allowing us to do a lot of really interesting stuff. And uh, this is also our path out of some really, really bad uh, technical decisions that have been made in the past because it allows us to do things like strangler patterns to get rid of some of the services that we don't need while maintaining the API. So basically, in short, um, I'm going to go back to uh, this slide because it's the, the one that I want to leave, leave you with. Microservices is really dumb. We don't have to do it anymore. Uh, please, please, please explore GraphQL mesh. Please try out modular monoliths and uh, have much more fun at work than having to deal with Kubernetes on an hourly basis. Thank you. Actually, this one's good too. Thank, thank you so much, Rohan. That was amazing. And so anyone has a question, want to ask him? Uh, I signed the docs that there's uh, plugging support or something for GraphQL Mesh. Did you see anything there that was particularly useful? Uh, <laughs> I haven't gone too deep into this side because, frankly, I didn't care about any of these things for the sake of uh, this presentation. But the one piece that I really want here is also proper introspection and uh, auto-generated types so I can pull in those types into our UIs. That's a major piece. And then after that, there's all like the other fun stuff of proper uh, properly uh, caching stuff, avoiding N plus one queries. Like there's a, a slew of other pieces and then there's authentication and all that that we need to do well. But again, there's this full out ecosystem here that if we were fully in node land, uh, I, I would go heavily more into, but we are a Django monolith. So at this point in time, we're trying to figure out how to escape from that.
Well, since you mentioned my name, somebody times. Um, <laughs> would, would you like a few stickers? So, um, funny enough, um, so That's as, a question. as I'm sure some of you know, uh, my company is guild.host, and then very confusingly, the GraphQL Guild invited me to GraphQL Conf under their sponsor badge, so everyone there could ask me if I'm part of the GraphQL Guild or Guild. And so um, they were so kind to give me a sticker. Here, here. Put them on, put them on. And, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll let you and everybody, um, ask for these stickers because these haven't been printed in a few years, and uh, certain people need to print them. <coughs> if I'm not and, you. Uh, thanks, thanks for watching. <laughs> uh, but I'll give you the covered GraphQL Guild sticker. I'll yeah. give you a Guild sticker so you can have Guild Wars. This is really what everybody came here for to see, right? Like me putting and, stickers uh, on the laptop. And since you're using Excalibur, I also have a TL Draw sticker for you because this one's way better. Um, and so there's actually a bunch more of these stickers over there if anyone else wants them as well. So uh, feel free to help yourself. There you Boom, go. There. Look at that. This one I don't want. That one you don't want? Wow. Here, th this one, I'll support you though. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Awesome. Uh, so anyone has more questions for Rohan? Uh, anyone? All right, thank you so much, Rohan. That was awesome. So now let's uh, welcome our next speaker, Dan Toniver. Well, he's getting ready. Let's give a quick introduction about Dan. Uh, some of the Dan's biggest uh, passion is uh, involving creating complex data structures, managing distributed systems, and mastering programming languages. He also brings smart and friendly folks together into an awesome community. During his free time, he loves to build uh, castles with his kids. So today, join us on this exploration of this mystery world of real graphs, which is the topic of this presentation today, and shall uncover the fascinating surprises Dan has prepared for you. So embrace yourself for this mind-blowing journey. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. Thanks. Yep. Am I on? I am not on. Nobody can hear me. Am I on now? Am I on now? Am I on now? Am I on now? Can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, great. Okay. Audio is coming through. Hold the mic closer. Ooh, that's the microphone. Yeah. Okay. Let me see if I can rearrange this. Yeah, yeah. Feel free. Easier because I can see it. It's like having someone else tie your tie for you. Are we getting married, Dan? <laughs> it's shaping up that, is that control. Is that oh, better? yeah, perhaps there is an on-device volume control. I think it might be, might be better here, honestly. It might be better where you had it, but yeah. I don't know how, but... Hmm. Hardware. Yeah. We're all software developers. This is hardware. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is why I don't do hardware. That's right. Is it working now? Or? I think it's on the mixer. might be better. I used to run a lot of events, and uh, there was a general consensus that the more experienced the developers were, the more confounded they became by AV and uh, setting everything up. I mean, you, we can do TypeScript, but not AV. Uh, right, yeah. Uh, where's the... The what, sorry? Where's the thing that I plug in to make the thing work? Oh, for your... Uh, just to oh, here it is. Ah, there. Yeah. The thing for the thing for the thing. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, uh, you want to keep talking so we can see the mic volume? Yep, we should keep talking. That's Maybe we can tell some stories. It's not bad, I don't think. Are you guys, if, if you can't hear, put your hand up. Uh, can you guys hear at the back? Yeah. Can you hear me? You can't hear me. Uh, yeah. You can hear me now if I project my voice. Okay, that's good. I'm still waiting for the screen to catch up. We're good. Thanks, Taz. This is going to be a very lightweight talk. Uh, but I want to start with something of a challenge. Can you spot the difference between... Oh, yeah, I have to face you for you to be able to hear me. Is that right? Quick time screen record as well. Uh, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, this guy thinks of everything. All right. Can you spot the difference between these two graphs while I interrupt you by opening up QuickTime? 
Does anyone know what this graph is called? No? Uh, this is the Peterson graph, actually. Um, it's an interesting graph. So one way to form this is by taking all of the two element subsets of a five element set. Those are your nodes. And then you connect the disjoint sets uh, to form the edges. As you can see in this diagram made by uh, Jaffith Wood that I have colored all over to make it harder to spot the differences, which you are probably all still very occupied with. Um, I don't know if that made any sense. Uh, so a five element set, uh, and we want to think about all of the two element subsets of this. So we'll pick an element. And then if we pick this one, one, two, three, four, five. If we pick one, we've got four left, right? So we're going to pick one of those four. So that's four two element subsets. If we pick two as our leader in, in the set, then we've got three left because we've already done one. We already counted that once. If we pick three, then we've got two left. And if we pick one, then we've got one left, right? Does that make sense? I don't know if I said that right. Anyway, uh, so 4 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1 gives us 10. And uh, yeah, combinatorics is easy. You can do it on your fingers. This graph also shows up a lot of other places. Um, it's in The Art of Computer Programming by Donald Knuth. Mm -hmm. As a counterexample, he, he explains that it's a very nice counterexample to many sort of naive theories that we might make about graphs. Uh, and how they are going to work. In this case, for instance, um, if you were to take a bunch of, well, this is a, a cubical graph, meaning that each vertex has three edges coming out of it. So if you were to take a bunch of random cubical graphs, just you know, put a bunch of points on a piece of paper, put three edges coming out of each of them, and you were to try to edge color those, meaning that you want to assign colors to each of the edges such that no vertex has more than one of a given a color that is coming into it from the edges that are connected to it. Then you would probably find that for most of those cubicle graphs, you could actually color them with three colors if you found a minimal coloring for them. But this is actually a counterexample to that. Uh, it is a cubicle graph that requires four colors to color it. So these graphs are called snarks thanks to Martin Gardner in the 70s, but they've been studied for uh, 150 years. Um, so, uh, right, anyone uh, see any differences? No, okay, uh, that's good. Uh, so let's see, let's see what happens when we load these into here. Uh, I'm going to, do something weird. Oh no, I'm not connected. Am I connected? Can I reload this? I cannot reload this. I shouldn't have tethered. <laughs> I think I'm good. Let's see. Okay. Uh, so I'm just going to make two copies of this. And then we're going to load that graph in. I had this cool thing where I could like literally drag those off of that page and drop them on here. Uh, but it, it doesn't work with Chrome for some reason. So I'm going to load them the old fashioned way by opening this dialog and putting them in here. And then doing that a second time because the first time didn't work. Hey, there we go. And then I'll do the same thing over here. This, is, this part is really just so you can see that I have nothing up my sleeves. OK, great. Oh, there's still no difference. Uh, what if we turn on party mode? Nothing there. Oh, hey, that's something. So this is called party paint. Um, it's a weird little silly paint thing that I made with my seven-year-old a few a weeks ago. Uh, it's just a way to kill some time on the weekend morning. Um, 
but it turned out to be really fun. And somehow those two graphs that look exactly the same, when we put them in here, look different, even though all I did was open up their PNGs. So something must be different about those PNGs. Um, and in fact, there's a whole bunch of stuff that you can do with PNGs, including encode um, all kinds of interesting things inside of them. Uh, oops, I, I didn't actually mean to do that. Uh, this is how you add a brush. I'll just show you Party Paint for a moment because it's kind of fun. Um, I was not expecting, uh, here, I'll do it over on this one. I was not expecting Party Paint to be as fun as it turned out to be. It's, it's sort of like finger painting, and the idea is that you can, um, you can just sort of mess around in here. It's way more fun for me, I think, being the one driving this than it is for you. Uh, Another surprise with Party Paint was actually the performance of it. Um, I'm mostly just showing a bunch of flashy images at the moment, I realize that. Uh, I'm looping through this entire array of pixels. There's like a third of a million of them, 360,000. Uh, every frame, so 60 times a second. And I'm actually doing that for multiple brushes. So every brush here that I add is going to potentially add more, um, uh, more of those loops. And initially, I tried, here's a weird JavaScript performance thing. Initially, I tried um, putting a single loop and then driving all the functions into that loop so that I would dynamically call the appropriate functions for the brushes that I had loaded uh, at the time that I needed them, which was every single pixel. So 360,000 function calls for each function for each brush that I had loaded, times 60. And this turned out to be slow, maybe not surprisingly. But it was a little surprising because I was only doing the loop once per frame, whereas now I'm doing the loop every time I have a brush. So I'm doing the loop, uh, well, in this case, I'm doing the loop four times per frame on this side. And that's actually way faster, which is very surprising. Yeah, computers are fast. I guess that's the moral of that story. So I want to show you what this looks like under the hood just for a moment. Uh, so I'm going to open up the JS console because there's another graph hiding inside here that I want to take a look at. Oops, that's not the JS console. There's another graph hiding inside here, which is that each of these brushes is actually just stuck inside of this JavaScript object. Some of them are very, very simple, like this one that just paints black. So it only has one set of controls. Uh, we can just increase the size. The eraser is very, very simple. It just erases. Some of them are a little bit more complex. Uh, mirror growth is a little more complex. This will, uh, uh, so mirror growth will, oops. Um, let me just start over. Yeah, so this brush will actually grow the mirror image across the XY diagonal of whatever I draw on here as I'm drawing it, uh, which is weird and also kind of fun sometimes. Again, more fun for me than it is for you, I think, right now. So what would happen if we could actually look at the graphs of these brushes themselves? Because this is a graph, right? Uh, this is a tree. The, the kind of JSON-y stuff here, it's not JSON, but the JSON-y stuff here is a tree, this JavaScript object. And then of course, this program itself is also a graph, not necessarily a tree, it might be a DAG as we start to parse that. So I added a couple of brushes that let us start to think about what that would look like. Uh, this one's very simplistic. Um, all it does is just show you the actual code of that brush. 
And then you can paint with the code of the brush that you happen to be using. So you can paint with your eraser brush in addition to using the eraser, which again is maybe more fun for me than for you. Uh, and so I, I made a different version of this uh, that actually parses the, uh, I should get rid of this one, that actually parses, oh, this is going to be very hard to see now. Uh, right, uh, let me put it on eraser mode. So what this is showing is, uh, oh dear, this is so weird. This is showing the, so this line that you can see here, this kind of jaggedy line is showing the eraser brush, which is up at the top there. It's parsing that JavaScript object and then it's reaching inside each of those functions and parsing that function and then just sort of randomly shaping that graph, but I mean, it's not random in the sense that it's deterministic, but it's random in the sense that there's no sensical ordering to the shape of those lines or the angles that they take as, as you step from token to token in the parsed graph. But it does have the branch points that you can see in here. And because eraser is so simple, there's very few branch points. But if we, if we start using a more complex brush, uh, if we, well, for instance, if we use the meta paint brush itself, which is semi-complex, then, oh dear, this is a mess. Uh, then we get this more, oh boy, I'm going to switch back to the eraser for a moment. Uh, then we get this more complex meta paint graph. So this is a brush that can be injected into a PNG which is then analyzing the brushes that were injected into that PNG. And at the moment we have it pointing to itself because I'm only painting with that brush. And so I'm now painting with the brush that is analyzing the brushes to do the painting. Right. Uh, so that's a, another kind of graph, I guess. And, and this, this, uh, this idea of putting a program into a PNG as opposed to putting it onto a website or something, but having like the ability to send you a program in an image file and, and you can actually make use of that um, is something that I've been thinking about for a little while, but actually the, the very first incarnation of that uh, I think is here. This was a surprise to me um, that this was even possible. Uh, my my seven-year-old, who I who has been doing all of the art direction for Party Paint and also helping me come up with ideas for brushes and uh, letting me know when the brushes are are ready to go, uh, made this maze. So this is a maze game in the form of a PNG. It contains the the brush information, and the goal is to get through the maze without I don't know if I can do it without touching these these shiny bits on the side, because if I touch those, then the kind of magical flowing fluid that's slowly making its way through this won't get to the end and fill up that bucket. So, uh, so the idea, I guess, extended beyond, hey, I'm going to make it. Cool. Yay. If I had touched it, yeah, thank you, thank you. I know, I know. <laughs> Yeah, if I had touched it, it would have filled in with, uh, with this other stuff, which is also sort of an active fluid that flows around inside these things. Um, yeah, so this is the easy version. There's a harder one somewhere uh, that you can, maybe I'll send you the PNG and you can try it. Um, thank you, yeah. I'll, I'll send it to Jen first. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm very interested in this idea of of having computational things, having programs that we can send to each other. The web actually started off this way, right? It started off as a place for sharing documents, really. But what if we wanted to share applications? Well, we've got this interesting security model with JavaScript and browsers where we can load up arbitrary code in a browser, but you have to have a place to put that. You have to start that from a web server. I can't really just send you an HTML file today and have you load it up. You can do that, but your browser is going to put a bunch of additional security concerns on it when you open it up from file colon slash slash. And so you can't really deliver a full-fledged web app that way. Almost, but not quite. 
but this is one way of circumventing that, is delivering applications as something that I can send you that you can load into a browser and exploit its security model. Of course, uh, if you're thinking about this from a security perspective, you might be slightly paranoid right now because anybody can put any brushes they want into that PNG, and then you're running that JavaScript code, right? This arbitrary code. But of course, any web page you load, you're, you're loading up arbitrary code and running it. Uh, and so the key is that you, I mean, to do this without blowing yourself up, uh, you can't have anything here in the back end. You can't use any cookies, certainly, because this will ruin you if you, if you evaluate arbitrary JavaScript on your web page when you're making use of cookies or other kinds of authentication on the back end, you'll have a very bad time. But if you don't have a back end, if you have no database, if there's nothing behind the curtain here, then you can run any JavaScript you want. And when you want to reload this, you just literally reload the page and you load a new application as a different PNG. So I, I like this model of building applications. It's weird, it only works for fun little games at the moment. But I like this model of building applications where I can send you the whole application as, as a PNG, potentially, and you can actually run that. And you don't need to, like, I don't need to build a database to hold your things. You can have your own things. So I've got one minute left. Uh, I'll show you one more graph, which is uh, this one. This is uh, a, a visualizer for a rig of a Toto file. One of the problems that you run into if you don't have a database, but you're sharing uh, programs with people and you're sharing objects with people, is that you don't have a consistent way of building a shared world between everyone because everybody's just doing their own thing. Uh, and so this data structure, which is a giant, this is a giant graph. Uh, most of them are not this big, but this one is huge, actually. It's quite large. Uh, and I'm not going to explain it because I'm at negative one minute right now. Uh, but this data structure allows us to be able to create objects that can prove that they have the same shared integrity, that they're part of the same shared world in the same way as if you were getting that source of truth from a database without having the database in play. So uh, that's my talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. That was amazing. So anyone has question about the real graphs that he has shown us? Uh, is it uh, just canvas? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Party Paint is, we, we started with like a blank HTML page and I said, well, what if we put a canvas on here? And then we just kind of went from there. It's about 300 lines of code for the game engine and I think the brushes are maybe 200 lines, that whole file that I was showing you, brushes.js, is like 200 lines right now. So it's very compact. Actually, it's open source. If anybody wants to add brushes, uh, you can just drop a brush into brushes.js as a PR and I'll, I'll accept it. So feel free. Yeah. It, it's a fun way to. Any yeah. physics over there? There's no physics. Uh, you could add your own physics, but try to keep it small. Uh, <laughs> Like, uh, this whole thing is sort of an experiment in addition to the, the program in a PNG experiment. It's an experiment in sort of programming in the small. So uh, programming in the small is fun because, and this kind of thing is particularly fun because, you know, you can get away with all kinds of weird things. There's global variables in play here, which usually you wouldn't want in a large program, but in a small program are fine. But then additionally, like, what we're looking for here in the brushes is unexpected interactions and unexpected effects which in our day jobs we call bugs. But here it's exciting, you know, interesting art that's happening. Most of these brushes were accidents. I was trying to do something else and I did something and I was like, oh, that's not right. And then my seven-year-old said, no, I like that. So we kept it. 90% of the brushes are that. Yeah. I, I was just thinking about the gravity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you could add, in just a few lines of code, you could add like a pseudo gravity where you, know, you could use like a cellular automata approach, for instance, to kind of pull things downward and have everything sort of fall, but in a really sloppy, weird way. Uh, so th that's what I would encourage you to try. If you, if you want to load a whole physics engine into a PNG, you could do that, but yeah, do, do it in a sloppy, weird way. It'll be more fun. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah of course. All right, awesome. Uh, more questions? 
what is encoded into the PNG itself? Like, what, what are you storing in the PNG? Yeah, so I store two things. Um, one is I store the whole program state. Um, so I, I have a single global variable called vals that has all of the current values for the brushes. I guess I should have explained this better. It wasn't really a talk about party paint, but, uh, but I like this a lot. It's fun. So in party paint, the, the, the conceit is that you use uh, AWSD as your brush controls. And, and you don't click to paint. You just paint. And if you hit spacebar, you toggle between your brush being down and up. So it, it's really like. It's like you're playing a first-person shooter or something, but you're doing the brush controls with that, which means you've only got four controls per brush. Uh, and then you toggle brushes using Q and E. So the, the whole thing is very sort of tactile and hands-on. It feels a little bit like finger painting or something. Um, I take the values that those brushes are using as, as the way that they understand their color and their size and everything else. I pack that in there along with all of the brushes, but I, I slam the functions into strings using a terrible one-liner that I wrote, uh, and then pack those into JSON. So I'm packing in a whole JSON blob into the PNG. That's one chunk in the PNG. And then the second chunk in the PNG is uh, an array of type information, which right now adds 360 kilobytes because it's a, a byte per pixel. Um, and that controls how the kind of uh, per frame active portion of the brush applies. Every brush has like a painting function, which might be trivial, it might do nothing, and it has a, a party function. And the party function is uh, what lets it affect every pixel on the screen. But most of them look at the type of that pixel first. I was using the alpha channel for the type originally. This led to horrible compositional effects. Uh, and then I pulled it out into its own array. So I'm slamming that into there as well. I could compress it down first. I'm not doing that currently. And so just when you load this into Canvas or if you just load this into the browser, does it just skip the first chunks of like it them and says, I don't know what this is? Yeah, yeah. PNG is a great format. You can add your own arbitrary chunks with a four character header where each of those four, it needs to be an alphanumeric character. And whether it's uppercase or lowercase is a signal that it means something different for each of those four characters. Super weird but kind of cool. And so the, this is like lowercase p, lowercase a, uppercase r, lowercase d is the four character uh, name for this chunk. And the PNG standard just says, hey, if you see a chunk you don't know about, ignore it. And so my JavaScript then gets a chance to reach into the PNG itself. I just smash the bytes of the file. Uh, and then I pull out that chunk that I'm interested in, the PARD chunk and read that. And then I pull out the second chunk that I'm interested in and read that. All right, awesome. So any more cool. questions? Thanks, everyone. Uh, All right, thank uh, you. I think we're out of time. Ask me after. Cool. Well, hey, um, uh, yeah, thank you so much for listening to my talk. Um, I thought, hey, I, I, I ended my talk on embeddable experiences. And uh, who better to get than the author the guy that wrote the book on third-party JavaScript. Um, so, uh, Mr. Ben Vinegar, everyone. Hello. Um, so yeah, I've known Ben for, I guess, a little while now. I can't even remember when I met you. Um, but uh, Torontonian works at, at Sentry Syntax. Um, yeah, so I guess, um, tell us more about this book, um, Ben. The, the, this book? Oh, wait, well, I have a microphone. We're good. Uh, th that, that microphone's for the video, oh. and then this microphone is for the audience. Oh, I see. Okay. Mm. All right. Oh, what is uh, Boy, talking about the book. It's a 10-year-old book. I think actually just watching that presentation, I'm like, we can throw it out now. It probably isn't very relevant. But um, the origin of the book is kind of, you know, it was, it was fun to kind of listen to that because it's very similar. It was like... Uh, at the time, I was working for this company called Discus, or Discus, D-I-S-Q-U-S, which um, is still floating around the internet, but was a little bit bigger in the past, where you could take an embedded commenting system and you could throw it on your website. Um, it sort of got popular when people first got into static site generators in the late 2000s, before rediscovering them a little bit later again. Um, and so when I started working at Discus in San Francisco in, in the early 2010s, I thought, 
wow, this is pretty neat. Trying to take JavaScript code and HTML and CSS and trying to drop that on other people's websites. Um, there wasn't really a guide for it. And so that turned into, you know, conference talks, not like this, and eventually a book. And um, that's the origin of that book. It's a mildly successful book. <clears throat> so, so why did you write a book? Um, because, you know, like, like folks like myself, for example, I'll give a talk on something. Maybe I'll write a blog post. But I won't be like, I'm going to write a book. Like, like what, essentially, why a book? Uh, that's a good question. Because, like, I mean, here's a, here's, a, here's a question. Here's a poll. Who, who has bought and read a programming book in the last, well, let's be generous, two years? Okay, maybe like 30%, 40%, that's not bad. Okay, what about one year? Okay, a little bit less, right? So books are, okay, but how about this? How many of you have watched a tutorial on YouTube on anything about programming? Okay. So, you know, that's, like, that's the situation today. But if you went back 12 or 13 years, you know, when YouTube wasn't really quite that big, you know, and we were just getting into the Lonely Island videos, and there was still time for it to grow, um, people had books, and I had books. You know, and I had, a, I had books on my shelf that I thought were interesting, like um, JavaScript, The Good Parts, or, the, or you know, the Crawford books. And um, John Resig, the creator of jQuery, had a book uh, that was called the, the Secret of the JavaScript Ninjas. Had a, it had, um, we were really into ninjas at the time. Um, and so these were aspirational things. And I think, uh, I never actually planned to write a book, but I gave a conference talk about third-party JavaScript at jQuery Conf in something like 2011. And a publisher reached out to me, not because of anything I did that was special, but more like they looked at who was speaking at this conference and they emailed everybody and said, who is going to write a book for us for very, very, very little money? And I decided to do that. Yeah, that's, you know, uh, and I could keep going on this, but it's sort of like once, once you sign on contractually to write a book, you know, which you feel very bold to do, but then when you've, d when you've sort of signed the document, then you go, oh shit, <laughs> I'm legally obligated to write a book. Like, like, uh, like how, many, how many pages? Um, yeah, I mean, at the time, See, also books have gotten a lot smaller. I don't know if people have noticed that in, in sort of programming book wor world. Like, if you did read a book recently, it might have been like 100 pages. Okay, O'Reilly has started making smaller and smaller books. But at the time, this was a 300-page commitment. And even when I signed that, I thought, well, we can get them to go down. Let's just sign the document first, and we'll figure out the rest later. Um, still a lot of pages, you know. Like, like for me, um, uh, way back, I don't know. 20 some odd years ago, um, I, like, 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 like back then I had programming books and those were like thick books, you know, like, like as a computer nerd, that was the closest I got to weightlifting, you know, <laughs> just, just lugging those things around. Um, so, um, so thank you for, for making the programming community fit essentially with your 300 page book. Um, third party JavaScript though, I mean, uh, the content in that book was actually um, uh, quite useful for myself, um, uh, building third party apps. I'm not sure I'm gonna call out Josh Kelly over there, I see Josh. Um, like, like I think I think I think we referred to that book way back in the day, didn't we? Like, probably, yeah. yeah, probably. Um, so um, uh, Josh and I worked at a company called Universe. We shipped um, third-party embeddable uh, ticketing widgets, uh, not not too dissimilar to what we're doing now at Guild. Um, and um, like your book, as an example, was quite relevant to us to um, you know ship third-party JavaScript. Um, I guess um, fundamentally, though, is was there something from that book or experience or your own experience at Discuss? Um, that was that, that, that essentially that you didn't expect, like something non-obvious when when shipping uh, th third-party JavaScript. Like shipping third-party CSS could be annoying because of style of rules conflicting. Um, with JavaScript, like if someone messes around with a prototype, is that like like how did like how do you think about those types of things? Um, just like like just to rephrase, like maybe what were some of the interesting things I learned just through the act of doing it. Um, you know, third-party scripting, and you had an example of that, right? Because you had a you had a web page with a script tag that you dropped, and you know, I recognize things are a lot different now, but it's sort of the same model, right? The moment that you drop a script on somebody else's page, you have to contend with that environment, and that environment could be the wild west. Like, you may think that it's an empty web page, but it might not. It could be that they've 
that web page has loaded a script that just garbles all the code. This is, I think, less common today, but if you went back 12, 13 years ago, like people really, like they really hit the sauce on random scripts that they would put into their website. People would put in custom implementations of built-in methods. Like I remember, um, you know, a big publisher website would have their own array.prototype.push. And you think, why in hell would you have overwritten that method? And you start using it. Oh, I'm just going to push some values onto an array. Except what you don't realize is that they've changed it in some minute way that they wanted. Um, and now your application is broken. And then they come to you and say, why did you break my website? Right? So I think a lot of that work was sort of, you know, how do you deal with an untrusted environment? Um, which is interesting because they're sort of like, I don't trust you. But I don't trust you either. It's a little bit of a cat and mouse game. So, you know, things like that. And that's where, like, kind of iframes came in. Like, iframes, um, in that book, I'm a big advocate of iframes. And uh, at the time, iframes had a pretty bad rap. Like, people didn't think they were very cool. I think they're awesome. Um, and one of the, like, sort of a re-architecture that I've discussed that um, I worked on in 2012 was to take all of Discuss and put it in an iframe, which is pretty contentious at the time. But the reason was that way we knew we could have like a clean JavaScript environment and we could do, it, we could do whatever we wanted within that box, right? Um, yeah, you know, just as an example. I don't know. I could keep going on this forever, but yeah. You know. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, for me, I just want Apple to come up with a digital picture frame, call it an iframe, and then iframes will be cool, you know? Mm -hmm. if, if Apple does it, like, like everything they make is cool. Um, awesome. Um, Oh, geez, iframes. Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> so many questions there. So you mentioned array.prototype.push. Um, uh, I think that's one of my, one of my favorite uh, things with uh, modern JavaScript. Uh, array.prototype.flatten um, conflicted with Moo tools. Um, like, hands up for Moo tools users. Yeah, yeah, only one. Oh, two? We got two Moo tools users. Ooh, nice. We got three of them. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm happy now. We got all three Moo tools users in Toronto in one room. Um, and so uh, they had they over overrode uh, array dot prototype that flatten, and that would have um, broke all the Moo tools websites. So there was a joke to call it array dot prototype dot smoosh, and I wish they came up with array dot smoosh because that would be the best method name in all of JavaScript. But alas, here we are um, without um, uh, array dot prototype dot smoosh. So. Um, but yeah, if someone did overwrite the prototype, what would you do? Would you just overwrite it back and like you know, like last one wins, like it's like you know, like like tag your it type of thing, or, or do you just uh, provide a different push, or like 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 what do you? I would even do something there. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so so the question is kind of just as like, let's say you want to interop with somebody else's web page and they've modified a function. How do you actually deal with that, right? Um, I'm just going to share an anecdote of this because this was actually an interview question for me to like get the job at Discuss. And I think about it whenever anybody thinks about like, boy, I really get some random trivia on an interview question. But this was actually legitimately an interview question. And at the time, I was here in Toronto, and I remember being on my computer like a, uh, in a tiny condo, as we're all very familiar with. Um, and I didn't know the answer because who would know the answer to that? Um, and I had not yet written a book on it, but they needed somebody who had that answer. So while the interview was going on, I opened up um, Chrome DevTools and Safari and Firefox. I just started mucking around like, hey, give me five minutes. Let me just mess around. And what I learned was that I tried like random stuff. Like I, so I created like an object and I overwrote a method. And then at some point, like I think I was just dorking around with it live on the interview, I decided to delete a property. And I discovered that on Safari, if you delete a built-in property, like a built-in method, like a rate up prototype dot push, Safari would restore it. And then the, on the other side, they were like, wait, really? And then they opened up their browser, and then they tried it, and they went, huh. I think that got me the job. <laughs> but um, so that's one way, <laughs> uh, which, but in the end, like that was actually, it didn't, this is kind of what third-party JavaScript used to be is, that was an irregular behavior of Safari at the time, and then maybe two years later it got patched out, right? So a lot of like what we did just to make any of this stuff work was to really like do a lot of research and exhaust ways of like abusing browser behavior just to like make anything work. Um, so I don't know if that's like a real question. Like the real answer is that you can load an iframe, 
and you can even actually load an iframe locally. And even if that iframe is empty, okay, so you don't actually have to load like a YouTube video or anything in it, you can uh, reach into the iframe's JavaScript um, window, and then you can get out clean functions and clean properties that haven't been touched by the parent page. That's the more scalable uh, standards compliant way to answer. Wow, it's, it sounds like you just passed the interview, Ben. So uh, congratulations, you're hired. <laughs> um, okay, that's very interesting. But no, but actually though, the real answer is you should have written it in Rust um, in the first place. So you know, um, yeah, I'm going to be that guy. <laughs> so okay, very cool. Um, uh, so, uh, like for me, like 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 I had a uh, embarrassing, annoying. I don't know. I don't, I don't know what word you want to use. Um, experience where uh, the marketing department asked us to embed some lovely JavaScript on our lovely, beautiful page, and um, that marketing department um, JavaScript tag um, to load um, took forever. It was just massive and bloated and horrible and increased our bundle size dramatically and was incredibly annoying. Um, and um, the nice thing about this page is that, you know, only uh, only a few people use it. It was only uh, while I was consulting for Yum Corp working on, you know, PizzaHut.com's delivery experience. That, like nobody use, nobody knows what Pizza Hut is or orders pizzas online or anything, you know. So um, w when that, when that um, uh, marketing tag uh, took down the entire site and lost, um, you know, I think it was $1.2 million worth of business in 42 minutes, something like that. Um, I wasn't, it wasn't, you know, it was, it was fine. Like, no, like no, 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 nobody really cared. Um, have you come across anything like that in terms of like bloat or a performance degradation or downtime in, in your career? Um, and would you have any advice to give that marketing department tag? Like the, the marketing department that wants you to put in an external script and to sort of help them recognize that that comes with like a lot of risks. Hmm. Uh, pff, marketing gonna market, you know, like I, I, marketing, that's my answer, marketing gonna marketing. Um, you know, at the end of the day, these scripts provide value to businesses and that's what they are, right? And is, is there some way that you would test for that? Like, is there some sort of automated tool that you would test for that against? Is there, yeah. So like in the book, it, it sets up um, like what is third party JavaScript and um, back, in the, back in the time, by the way, like people thought J, like third party JavaScript was equally like jQuery, like oh, I'm loading jQuery that is authored by a third party, ergo that is third party JavaScript. And one of the things we do in the book is just sort of say, is to sort of make it more uh, defined to say that third-party JavaScript is actually something that you are loading from a third party that is inherently untrustworthy. Like you don't control it, it can actually do anything. And that's like, you should think of it that way. Like if you put an open source library on a CDN, even though you know somebody else authored it, you kind of like you know what's there, right? You can even put like an integrity um, SHA thing in there to make sure that it's a script, right? Like you control it, right? I think the answer, like perhaps there's new answers to this that are beyond me, but I think the answer is you have to trust that party. Once you basically put um, the script tag in your website, you are inviting, you know, latency problems, you are inviting um, random JavaScript to do whatever, right? It's, it's technically even like a cross-site scripting, potentially like injection vector, like what if that website gets attacked and then a, like a, an attacker takes over that, that sort of, you know, script and then pushes down code onto your website, like comes with actually like a lot of risks. So I think like a lot of it comes down to trusting the party and, you know, their reputation and their history and sort of like, you know, um, I know that we, um, like Sentry also distributes third-party JavaScript as part of its error reporting tool. And it, comes with a, um, like you can set the, uh, the integrity SHA so you can make sure that what you're getting is like what it's gonna be, et cetera. So I suppose that's one thing you can do. Um, 
But even then, it doesn't really matter because you know, I, I, it's too complicated. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, for, for perhaps this. Yeah, it's okay. Like like for me, I always trust everyone at parties. So um, everything they say, I take as absolute truth. Um, a, a very interesting. Um, uh, what was I? What was I going to say? I I, I forgot what I was going to say. So thanks for that, Ben. <laughs> um, uh, okay, cool. Um, yeah. So uh, this format is actually meant to be a um, interactive discussion with with the audience as well. So if anyone actually has a question, feel free to put your hand up, and um, I'm happy to uh, take any sort of audience questions as well. So any questions from the audience? Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, in the back. Uh, yeah, have you seen anything that's uh, lately, like, a very popular service that you're like, hmm, that's not good, or something like that that's not too hot? <sighs> Oh man, like, I don't think I'm like the third party script police or like, you know, like, you know, maintaining a directory of, of good actors. I don't, I don't have anything like that. I'm trying to think about like what are, what are popular. Like, I have one. Oh, it's, yeah. Like yeah, like like so so for me, um, uh, whenever I get a, like essentially a lovely Bitcoin miner uh, embedded on my page, um, you know, it's really nice because it gets cold in the winter and that keeps me warm. And so um, you know, I, I like to think optimistically about these types of things. Um, I don't. I, I don't want. I do want to highlight this. Like we are basically all running untrusted code all the time. If you don't know that, when you're loading an npm module, you are loading the script tag onto your server, and or onto your local desktop. So that's why sometimes it's sort of like, wow, putting this on my web page. That's crazy. I don't know. I kind of actually think you're probably running a whole bunch of crazy stuff all the time. Um, I've looked into node modules and found um, AWS security credentials just sitting there um, or node modules that the only purpose of that node module is actually to sideload a script from an HTTP server, you know, so I, I guess this is like a PSA to, to just consider like everything is unsafe. That's a it, uh, and that's a good, that's a good call. Um, in fact, at a recent conference in Toronto, Refactor, uh, Toronto, um, there was a lovely guy, Faros, there that was speaking about his company, Socket Security, that I'd, I'd recommend checking out. Uh, basically, I'm going to try to explain it very poorly. Um, so check, 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 like definitely check that out for a better explanation. But my poor explanation is that it's um, kind of like an AI bot thing that kind of analyzes your code for common attack vectors or like third party code for common attack vectors and will highlight that to say, hey, um, like, like th this package has an attack vector. And I mean, of course, GitHub has a lovely, um, you know, bunch of analysis and so on as well. Yeah. You should also inspect all of your PNG files. <laughs> We're coming after you, Dan. <laughs> um, cool. Any other questions from the audience? Oh, Jen in the back. I just like, yeah, because you've written a whole book on third body, third party JavaScript, I am wondering what is the most bizarre or outlandish or insecure use case of third party JavaScript you've seen so far? Um, most insecure use case. Um, I'll share an anecdote that I don't know, like, if this is like, I think this is where you're going for, which is like, all right, Ben, you've seen some stuff. What can you share with us, right? Well, I, me I mentioned, uh, I'm trying to formulate this, I'm trying to decide on this. See, the reason why there was never like a book written about this stuff is like, who actually does, who is the biggest third party JavaScripter in the world? Do you know the answer? Huh? Yes, ergo, like Google. I'm, I'm guessing analytics, right? Google Analytics, right? Or the ad, you know, AdSense, AdWords, okay. Uh, and I'm sharing that to say, like, I think generally, in AdWare, like the whole, like all of that is, these are the biggest use cases for sure. And the reason there's no book is that these are closely guarded secrets, okay? Like. Hey, I found a way to distribute a script in a more kind of exciting or more successful way. I'm holding on to that. That's what that's typically what people in this space did. And there was even a question when we wrote the book of like, well, this is kind of our competitive advantage. Should we share that? Right? So that was a conversation we had. Um, you know, but when you're a scrappy little startup company and you do like crazy stuff, you're like, oh, why not? Let's just do it. Um, so that's a preamble to this answer. Um, 
which is at one point we discovered that uh, there was a way to bypass third-party cookies in Safari. And what that means is your browser has a way to sort of reject third-party cookies, right? And probably, hopefully, many of you have that enabled, okay? But for an application that's dealing in, in um, third-party applications, especially third-party applications with authentication, uh, third-party cookies are actually kind of important for the functionality, right? So if you think about how Discuss worked, it is, um, you know, it's a box, it's an iframe, and in there we show your face, okay? Um, and I'm trying to think exactly how this worked, but like the iframe technically is its own sandbox, so when it connects over to, you know, discusses servers, I think that's a first party connection because it's all within there, so if you are, if you have a session, right? The challenge is signing in, and how do you even set the cookie? and where it gets initiated from. And I know at one point we came up with sort of a, like, look, I'm kind of like, there's a lot of hand waving in the details of this. Like I probably have to write like a five page blog post, but there was a moment where we sort of found a way, um, like when you're writing an application and it's a product, you want people to sign in as easily as possible. And for a time that meant that, I think this was actually before the iframe, which is probably why this has occurred it meant that we wanted you to sign in immediately on somebody else's website, okay? But that meant setting a third-party cookie. So eventually, you know, we learned that Chrome or some other, or Firefox wouldn't let you do that. And we would open up a window and now you sign into the window. And so if you've ever wondered why, when you click like a button that says sign in and it brings you to another window and I got to sign in over there, it's usually because of this. It's usually because of first and third-party cookies, okay? But we wanted to sort of like have a degrade, we, like the more steps you introduce to somebody, you lose them. So if there was a chance to kind of do it in a better way, we would do it. And we discovered that there was some like, there was like a really contrived way where you could trick, you could trick Safari into sort of just letting you do it. And I think we rationalized to ourselves that we were using this for good purposes, which was to let you sign in and to use our product. Um, I believe that what I thought was my own discovery, I think I later learned everybody knew about this thing and they were all holding it to themselves because they were all using it to abuse it for sending ads and for other things. Um, in the end, it got patched out after somebody raised it, yeah. But probably years later. Anyways, I don't know if that's an anecdote of what you're thinking, but sort of like this is a, it's a little like, it's like a gray area of software development. There's a bunch of weird stuff that goes with that. It's, um, that sounds pretty wild, Ben. You know what else is wild? Being on Safari. Um, so, um, <laughs> um, you're, you're welcome, everyone. Um, crazy. Uh, wow, I never would have guessed that at all. That's that's completely well, yeah wild. Um, uh, yeah, um, I guess I guess we'll wrap up because we are running out of time, and uh, you know I guess we have a bit more time at the venue as well. Um, so yeah, I guess I'll ask you um, a question about you now. <laughs> so uh, you were at Discuss, you're now at Sentry, uh, you're at Syntax FM now uh, with the lovely Wes and uh, Scott. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I guess I guess tell us more about what you're up to these days, uh, Syntax, Sentry, anything else you'd like to mention? Oh, this is like, this is the shameless plugs or? Yeah, wh whatever you like. Oh, oh, just like, what am I up to? What's going yeah. on? What's, what's going on with Ben? Um, yeah, so I've been at Sentry for like eight years. I've been there for a long time. And um, I guess my intro that I wrote myself said I was the VP of engineering. That's true. Um, and right now, like we sort of acquired um, Wes and Scott and Syntax. Um, but we did that in a way that was like, hey, what if we can make this bigger? So, because um, we we're very mindful of like, there have been times where a startup says, Hey, let's acquire this content website, CSS Tricks, and that'll be cool. And then a year later, it's dead. And none of us want that. Uh, so, you know, we kind of approach this relationship in a very different way, which is, hey, we think syntax is really cool. We think that the audience that you have is, you know, really relevant to what we're doing. What if we just kind of gave you more money to do cool stuff? What would that look like? And so that's... That's the origin of why syntax is part of Sentry. And that's why like um, my role as general manager, we've kind of like treated it as its own little sub company. So it's not, it's to kind of like keep it pure. It's just, so, you know, 
we have a sales deal and a, and a CTO says, boy, I'll close this deal if I can be on the podcast, the answer is no, because this is a separate division of the company and we don't do that, right? And so they create their own, you know, they, there's no sort of like, boy, we'd love for you to talk about errors or whatever, like that doesn't really happen. Um, but instead we do some cool stuff. This is the segue to what kind of cool stuff we've done. Like we've launched a new website, um, which is at syntax.fm, which you can check out. And it does some neat stuff like we're doing um, automatic transcriptions and then using AI to identify like whose voice is whose and then uh, doing like a really cool experience where you can hit play on the website and then it'll like go through in line, like identifying the words and who's talking. Um, we just launched a swag store, which I'm, I'm like, I'm like, highlighting you know some products here um because that's something that um wes and scott have done is just sort of put out merch so we're like oh, what if we had a store is, it, is that something you'd like to do sure um and then uh, we also started a newsletter and uh, we're gonna make uh, more stuff cool web stuff that's yeah Sounds pretty awesome. Um, yeah, well, thanks again, Ben, for um, agreeing to this discussion. Um, so we had this chat on Slack, and I'm like, Ben, let's do it. And um, I'm glad we did it because, um, yeah, um, he's one of those like super interesting guys um, that I, I personally enjoy talking to. I, I've, I've enjoyed uh, your book in the past and, you know, enjoy hanging out. The stuff you're up to now at uh, Sentry and Syntax, I mean, you know, big fan of Wes Boss, big fan of Scott Talinsky, and now big fan of Ben Vinegar as well. And uh, the lights have went off to tell us we're out of time, I guess. So, um, yeah, thank you all so much for our discussion, and um, I'll give the mic back to Sammy. Thanks, Thanks. All right, awesome. Thank you, Ben and Tess, for this uh, wonderful discussion. And I believe that concludes the, today's event. Thanks again for all these wonderful speakers for being here and share the knowledge with us. So please feel free to stick around until 10 p.m. And that concludes today's event. See you guys next time. <laughs>